All right, welcome back. Um, so this is gonna be shorter than the previous video. Um, like I said, I originally wanted to do these as one um, longer video, but my voice was just starting to get really raspy <laughs> as a result of talking constantly. So I just wanna finish up with the, the, the Tales of Issa. So let's get back to our thingamajigger. So here we go, Tales of Issa, Issa Monogatari circa 947. We're just gonna skip over the introductory bits for a bit. Okay, going back to our outline. So the second type, sorry, I have a cough drop in my mouth to try and keep my throat easy going. So the second major type of song tale, is a, all right, sorry, the video thumbnail was on my right was getting a little wonky. So the second major type of monogatari that we're going to talk about is the so-called song tale, or as it says here in Japanese, uta monogatari. Um, and as I noted earlier, when it comes to sort of prose fiction in the Heian period, the poetry connection or song, because remember, um, uta, generally, sort of Japanese poetry is generally referred to by as songs rather than poems. This connection is a really strong and really important one, and definitely if you're talking about the Genji, you're going to need to be familiar with it. So many of the tales in the Issei Monogatari are based on poems by, or at least attributed to, this guy I mentioned earlier, um, Ariwara no Narihira no Asun, who was a real dude, or for all intents and purposes, seems to have been a real dude. But the tales told from those poems definitely read like elaborations at best, and in some cases just completely made up, pure fiction. So it's worth noting that even though we're talking about a real figure here, these are kind of like, you know, tall tales told about, say, like, you know, Abraham Lincoln or uh, George Washington, like the whole George Washington and the cherry tree thing, or sort of like the classic Honest Abe story which are probably bullshit. <laughs> um, this is not, these are not reliable sources of information for um, Narihira's life. So even though we're talking about a real dude, bear in mind that these are, this is fiction that we're looking at. Um, the Issei Monogatari also is a sort of clear midpoint between sort of those, those cruder prose bits. So this stuff that we saw over here in the poetic anthologies and what is generally considered to be sort of the full flower of Heian period fiction in the, the tale of Genji. Um, in the Genji, interestingly enough, tales, so there's this chapter called Hotaru in the Genji, um, fireflies, that's just the Japanese word for fireflies, in which there's this lengthy discussion between, if I remember correctly, it's Genji, Murasaki, and, uh, maybe Fujitsubo and then a couple of other women. I don't remember it off the top of my head. It's been a while since I taught the Genji, or at least taught that chapter of the Genji. Um, and they kind of agree that the value of tales of Murogatari lies not in so much, well, it is in what they say, but they're, they're valuable precisely because they give a more complete picture of the human condi condition than the old historical chronicles. If you think about it for a moment, like think about the Kojiki and how much really, how much emotional depth is there really in the Kojiki? The Kojiki in being, in thinking of even mythology as kind of a historical record, it's just like, and this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and this happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There isn't really much, sort of much depth of character. The characters, I mean, this is sort of true of mythology in general. Like characters tend to be not terribly well fleshed out. They just have attributes, really. I mean, and it's even embedded in their name, you know. Amaterasu is the shiny heaven lady, and she shines, and she's the sun, so she's shiny heaven. That's it. Susano is the angry dude, is the ragey dude. And it, you can see it in all the things he does. He rages, and he's a dude. That's it. <laughs> There's not really much complexity or depth. Whereas the hand period writers, they love to talk about their feelings. They love it so much. Feelings, 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 feelings. <laughs> um, but the sort of the, okay, 
let's look at the sort of episode nine, the the journey. What is listed here is the journey to the eastern provinces. This is just a totally like made up interpolated English title. Um, usually it's referred to as the Yatsuhashi um, episode due to the the eight bridges in Mikawa. So um, I have a sort of soft spot in my heart for this tale because um, I lived in Mikawa, what is now the uh, south and e southern and eastern portion of Aichi Prefecture. So Mikawa no Kuni, which is where all the best, it's where Tokugawa Ieyasu was originally from. So Mikawa, Mikawa Warriors. <laughs> There's actually a museum exhibit in Okazaki called Mikawa War. You don't, you guys don't care about this. Anyway, I know a lot about Mikawa as a result. Um, the the poem, so the central poem. There are several poems in this in this episode, but sort of the most important one is is the first one, which is this acrostic. So what is an acrostic? So it's all based there in the in Yatsuhashi. In fact, this is near um where is Yatsuhashi? I think it's near Anjo. No, Chudyu. It's in Chudyu. Again, you guys don't care about Aichiken. Anyway, so so there is a there is a Yatsuhashi thing, and there's this iris festival in Chudyu every year, and these sort of rabbit-eared irises in Japanese they're called kakitsubata. And so then each of these um, syllables then becomes the first syllable of one of the phrases, of one of the five phrases of the poem. So you have the ka and ka. Ki, tsu, ha. I don't want to get into it. Ha is the ba. Just accept this. Uh, I, if you if you really care about why the ha is the ba, email me and I will explain it to you. And ta. So the poem, since I have a wife familiar to me is the hem of a well-worn robe, I think sadly of how far I've traveled on this journey. So, you know, just kind of very basic emotional expression. But again, in the poem, we see the emphasis on um, technical craftsmanship. So it's not just about like the effect, of, it's not just sort of the, the ideas and the emotions you express in the poem. It's also about sort of like your, the, the technical skill of composing a poem in this sort of arbitrarily contrived way. So it's not just that, you know, you have sort of an elegance of feeling, but also you have a kind of elegance of poetic craftsmanship. <laughs> As I note here, <laughs> mopey guys is a thing in the end period. Um, the the episode begins as this like, oh, actually, I should talk about this for a second. The in the past bit. So if you look at the, um, oh, I didn't talk about this with the Takatoni Mogatari. Actually, I'll talk about it now. So if you look at the text in Japanese, so the first sentence is pretty straightforward. Mukash. Otoko, ah, arikeri. So in the past or in a previous age, a man there was. Sono otoko, that man, miyoyo nakimono ni omoi nashite. So I, anyway, I'm not going to get into reading all this in detail, but the, sort of this, this phrase is very common. It's not always used, but it is very common in the tales of Isa. So, Mukashi in, so in a previous age, in the past, there was a dude. Now, interestingly enough, Narihira is not ever, well, okay, is usually not named in the text. It's just referred to as a dude. An otoko. And again, in the Takatoni Monogatari, just to go back, so again, it begins with this notion of bukashi, so this, like, in the past or in a previous, or the and the tale of the bamboo cutter begins with this really odd phrase, "Ima wa mukash." Now is back then. <laughs> now, now it's back then, and, and you know there was a something or a person called um, Takitori no Okina, um, the old bamboo cutter. Again, I don't really. I mean, so that's how it begins. But to <laughs> To okay, so specifically this section. Sorry, I got off track a bit because I wanted to talk about that. So he says, having made up his mind that his position was worthless, he thought that he should live in the east rather than in the capital, and he should set out to find a province where he could reside. So this is actually kind of a pretext for talking about 
I mean, in many ways, the the whole idea of like that he he could he couldn't really stay in the capital any longer. Like that's just kind of a MacGuffin. It's there to get him to go on the trip. And in the trip, you see him go to various places. You see him go to this place in in Mikawa. You see him go to Suruga. So to, specifically to Mount Utsu or Mount Reality in Suruga. There's a lot of puns in this episode, and it's just and that's explained in these footnotes. And then eventually to Mount Fuji, to the Sumidagawa, which is, for those of you who are familiar with Tokyo, that's this is near where Tokyo will be because Tokyo doesn't exist at this point. In fact, the city of Edo doesn't even exist at this point. And so you see this like Eastern journey. I guess that's, I don't know what I'm doing with my hand there. And anyway, you, you see this Eastern journey play out. And so it's more like, uh, I didn't really talk about this, but there are these um, Japanese sort of prose texts, which are really sort of, they're called gazetteers is usually the way they're translated, fudoki. And really what they were is they were these kind of like pamphlet, I don't even really know how to describe it, but it's a text in which sort of like information about like demographics, local culture, stories, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're sort of like these information booklets that were made for the imperial household and they're called fudoki they often contained um stories and folk tales and things like that and sort of they're considered to be another basis for um japanese prose fiction at this time and so you see a little bit of that where you sort of you're, you're getting a little bit of information about each of these areas you get some information about mikawa you get some information about suruga and you get some information about mount hie about um the Musashi and Shimotsusa provinces, the Sumida River there. And so like there's this I, this presentation of like, you know, it's almost like a tourist brochure, if you will. And you see it almost, and this tale in many ways functions as a kind of like early form of travel literature, although it's very, it's not quite as detailed as an extensive as later Japanese travel literature will be. And it will be very extensive. So the, the, let's see, do I have, yeah, okay. So episode 69, nice, <laughs> is the, the, is the um, episode in the tale that actually get, gives it its title. This is the one that specifically deals with Narihira going to Ise. Again, in this, we get this fixed phrase. Oh, sorry, it's not that one, it's this one. Let's see if I can find 69. 65, 66, 69, there we go. So again, mukashi otoko arikeri, sono otoko ise no kuni ni um no kuni ni um kari no tsukai ni ikikeru ni um kanu ise no saimia. I actually don't know how that's supposed to be read here. Mia nari keru hito no oya. So the, the the dad of the person who has become the, the shrine maiden. I really wish I could remember how this is pronounced, but I don't. And so in that, at that Issei, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, again, it begins with the same set phrase. That's all the point I was trying to make. So here we get a much more fleshed out version of this. So what is here, basically two sentences. Now we get an entire like actual story. So apparently he didn't just go to Ise, he went there to be to serve as the Imperial Huntsman. And the the priestess was apparently told that the sort of dramatic situation is that they came in contact because the priestess was told by her parents. It says here the mother of the high priestess, but interestingly enough, I don't think it's actually set, a settled question because the Japanese just is Oya, just his parent. And I think in other translations, sometimes they translate it as father. One of her parents, or possibly even both of her parents, told uh, their daughter to treat him better than she would the usual, usual messengers. Since these were her parents' instructions, she took very good care of him. In the morning, she, and by very good, so it's not stated explicitly here, but by very good care of him, it's implied that it's a sexual encounter. In the morning, she saw him off on his hunting, and when he returned in the evening, she had him stay in her own lodgings. In this way, she treated him well. Um, 
then there's this bit where the sort of like he's unable to see her and then as a result of being unable to see her then and that explains sort of the context for for the poem below and so then you get this much more like extended explanation for the, the literally the exact same poem kimi ya kosh ware ya yukikem omoizu yume ka utsutsu ka nete ka samete ka and actually i wonder did they translate it the same way or is it translated differently Oh, it is translated differently, slightly differently. Did you come to me? Did I go to you? Did I visit you? So even though it's literally the same Japanese text, they did translate it slightly differently, but not so differently that... Um, yeah, that's right. So one of the things I noticed, noted when talking about the reply poem, so she, as a result of, you know, sorry, no, sorry, she sends this poem to him and then he is so sad that he responds, kakikurasu. And then what's interesting is that in the Tales of Ise, this poem, which is an extremely famous poem, is actually different. Like the text of the poem is different from what appears in the Kokinshu. In the Kokinshu, you have, you know, let others decide, yo ito sadame yo. But in the Tales of Ise, it says, koyoi Sadameyo, which means something more like, you know, tonight, let us decide. So the the narrative context of like sort of the, 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 in, the intimate space in which these two are interacting with each other has also transformed the poem as well. And so again, you see this very clear interaction between the poetic text and the prose text and how the two are, as the prose text becomes more fleshed out in the Tales of Ise, it has this effect on the poem itself. Like the poem has actually changed very subtly, but very importantly. Instead of like letting other people decide, now it's the lovers themselves who will, will figure it out. Um, also, very interesting in this particular um, vignette is this bit right here. So... I'm just going to read this. After sending this to her, the, the poem above that had, like I noted, had been changed. She went out hunting. He rode through the fields, but was distracted by thoughts of meeting her that night, soon after the others went to sleep. But the governor of the province, who also oversaw affairs at the shrine, had heard that an imperial huntsman was visiting. He kept the man drinking through the night, and the pair was quite unable to meet. Since he had to move on to Awadi province the next day, the man wept tears of blood unbeknownst to anyone, but still they could not meet. When dawn was breaking, a poem came from the woman written on the saucer of a cup of parting. And this is really important. So this whole idea of like poems appended to objects, we will see this again. He took it up and read, um, since ours is a bond shallow as waters that do not went the hem of a traveler's robe. And interestingly enough, this is sort of possibly a reference to the the traveler's robe um in an in the um uh, episode nine poem the, the the acrostic not definitive but it could be but notice how we don't actually have a complete poem here so we have you know the five phrases of a tanka are broken up into two separate poems so there's the bit she sends to him and then there's the bit that he returns back with. Again, I will cross the gate of me meaning. This is sort of a pun on the, the name Osaka, which really means Aousaka. So like the, the gate of meeting or the place of meeting. And so here we have encapsulated the idea that sort of is intrinsic to all Tonka poetry in Japanese society at this time, sort of conversational or like a dialogic mode. The, the poem itself has been broken up into these two parts. And by the way, this is sort of like the way in which Japanese poems will, from this period on, be conceived of as having a kami no ku, or upper phrase, upper verse, and a shimo no ku, or a lower phrase, lower verse. So in this instance, here we have the upper, and here we have the lower phrase. Um, but it's not just like, oh, here are the two conceptual halves of the, this poem. It's that this one poem is sort of being composed by two individuals who are sort of in dialogue with each other. So, I mean, I've talked about the importance of, of aesthetic practices and how, like, it's not just about what you say, it's about how elegantly you do it. But 
here more than anywhere else, you see the emphasis on poetry as a conversational practice, as a way, as a means of communication. It's not just a way to sort of express your feelings or your thoughts. It's a way to literally talk to people. And this sort of, this having of the poem between like two individuals sort of demonstrates that to my mind very well. All right, there's quite a few other, I mean, they have a lot of the shorter ones. Well, maybe not the, I don't really like the, I don't like 82. The last one I want to talk about is the, the rain test poem, rain test vignette. So this is, um, this involves another um, real person, um, Fujiwara no Toshiyuki. Again, real person, but fictionalized. Who, um, so I talked earlier about sort of the reason why um, Monogatari were valued so highly amongst sort of the, the, the courtiers of this time is because they sort of, they show the full range of human experience. It's not just like, this guy was a prince and he did this thing and he defeated these people and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're talking about human emotions. Hum like, and so you don't get, just get like the, the romantic you don't just get the tragic as we saw in, you know, in, in the previous one. There's also comedic elements as well. There's, they're funny sometimes. Um, so there's this guy, um, Fujiwara no Toshiyuki, who was a private secretary, began to pursue a girl of the, the man. This is um, Narihira's household. The girl, however, was very young, knew little of writing, had no command of diction, and could hardly compose a poem. The man, which is Narihira, prepared a draft of a poem and had her write it out and send it off. The recipient was quite dazzled. And then we get, Fuji, and then we get Toshiyuki's reply. So Toshiyuki thinks that he's, you know, corresponding with this beautiful young woman, but because she's so unlearned and she doesn't know what she's doing, Narihira takes it upon himself to correspond on her behalf. So even though he thinks that he's corresponding with this young woman, he's actually corresponding with Narihira and he falls in love with this woman as a result of essentially falling in love with the things that Narihira has written. And so, you know, like I said, there's a, there's a kind of comedic component to this. And, okay. And then the, did I, uh, oh yeah. So well, in addition to sort of that comedic bit, I want this also, this um, vignette also demonstrates something that you'll see consistently in um, Japanese literature of this period, which is sort of like the relative subject positions of men and women in romantic relationships. So the, the man is sort of expected to be kind of almost hyperbolic in his emotional expression. Helpless to meet you, I only gaze on these endless rains, a river of tears drenching my sleeves. And he literally says that, Namiragawa, a river of tears drenching his, so they know me, each day, drenching his sleeves. Oh, Yoshimonashi, unable to meet you this this time. So it's like, it's like I cannot see you. And here, I sit in my bedroom, drowning in a river of my own tears. You know, it's kind of, it's a bit much. But that's sort of what's expected of men in these relationships, is to be kind of just like, I love you so much. If I can't see you, I will bleed from my eyes. I adore you. And then the woman's reaction is supposed to be almost kind of like mocking and doubting and cynical. How shallow a river of tears that wets only your sleeves. When I hear you are drowning, I'll trust the depths of your love. It's like, oh, a river of tears got your sleeves wet. Well, if it's a river, why aren't you drowning in it? So yeah, there's this kind of cynical attitude that the women are expected to adopt. And so, so the men are supposed to be hyperbolic in their emotional expressions. The women sort of be kind of off-putting. It's like, oh, really? Okay. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up here is because we will see it again when we come to read the Genji. Um, but that is it for this week. Um, if you guys have any questions, of course, as always, feel free to email me or get in contact with me however you prefer. Um, show up to the non-mandatory class session on Wednesday or also to my um, sort of Zoom office hours uh, that take place after that. Otherwise, like I said, just get a hold of me however you can. Um, so until next time, um, take care of yourselves and have a good week.